Hello, Mike. 19 years at Mark and Spencer leading the sustainability journey. Now working freelance across the economy, including with my good friends at Kogo. Now, look, one of the things we, we really want to explore with you today is sustainable consumption. How do we put citizens at the heart of a very different way by which we consume food, clothing, telephones, everything in our lives? And what I'm delighted today that we've got a brilliant speaker in this space, Paul Lindley, to join us for the Good Impact series. Now, it's a series that um, Kogo has been running throughout this year, really exploring different ways by which we as citizens can get involved with change. Paul, I'm delighted that you've joined us. I'm going to ask you in a moment to say a few words about a very rich career that you've, um, you've followed uh, on this journey. And then we're going to explore the future. How do we really put citizens at the heart of uh, a sustainable future going forward? So, Paul, let me start with you. Just tell me a little bit about your very, very interesting career today. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. A fabulous webinar to be on. Thank you for having me. Um, well, I have been working for 30 years, which is incredible to me uh, now. I started off as a chartered accountant. Knew I wasn't a suited and booted guy, but knew I needed to understand a little bit more about business if that was my career further on and uh, setting up my own. Um, so qualified as a chartered accountant, moved to Nickelodeon as the financial controller. And I stayed there for uh, nine years and ended up as the general manager. So that was where my journey went from understanding about brands, understanding about putting consumers first, understanding about the whole operation and leadership within a company. Um, and how finance fits, but also how marketing fits, how understanding people fits, and really how psychology leads businesses. Um, and then towards the end of there, I, uh, two things in my life came together, for, allowed me to set up my own company um, and gave me the confidence behind the idea. One was the experience of those nine years at Nickelodeon and really being exposed to the fact that our, our kids, generation on generation, are getting less healthy. And, and I was sitting where television was being blamed for that. Um, either were watching bad ads or they were not doing exercise or watching television and we were trying to, to, to address that but I saw it was a problem and, and I thought we can't continue it's a sustainable way our society lives um, if our kids are getting less healthy generation on generation but at the same time I was having my own children my first child Ella um, and uh, when she was sort of a baby Going into a toddler, she sort of uh, stopped uh, experimenting with food as she had been. And uh, I did what I'm best at, silliness, games, mess, making her laugh, popping a spoon in her mouth when she laughed and, and worked out that if food can be fun for kids, then they'll eat it and they'll, they'll have a good relationship with it. If you can make that food healthy, then you solve a society problem as well as a family problem, as well as a, uh, an enjoyment uh, challenge. And uh, so I tried to put those together and I started Ella's Kitchen um, in 2004. I left my job, gave myself two years to set up the business. We launched in 2006. Uh, and then it was just a fast paced, put on the accelerator growth story, um, which uh, we doubled, at least doubled our turnover every year for the first seven years to over a hundred million dollars worth. Uh, we were profitable from the beginning, but crucially, uh, I think the business was built on this mission that I had of to help kids live a better life uh, and have a better relationship with food. So um, I sold in 2013 um, uh, and uh, tried to use, in the years since, I've tried to use my experience and my passions to do one of two things. One is to um, help business be this better force for good in society. That involves changing the economic system, but it also involves nudging the current economic system. So things like I'm involved with B Corp Corps, uh, the B Corp movement, I'm involved with Share Action, um, I'm involved with some non-for-profit businesses and, and, and trying to campaign for better business. And then on the other side, and, and somewhat overlapping, uh, I work to try and improve children's welfare and to improve the opportunities that every child can have in life. So I chair uh, London's Child Obesity Task Force for the mayor, um, on the board of Sesame Street, uh, a non-for-profit fantastic business. Um, and I do a whole load of small advocacy things that just try and make the next generation better than the last one so that we have this responsibility to deliver a world that is better than we found it and it's something that they can build on and make it much more sustainable as we are in the middle of the crisis that we're in. Um, Paul, I mean, j just to pick up on some, some amazing achievements already, and may I say a short career already, so much more still to come, sir. <laughs> That's right. The, just let's pick on this theme of, you mentioned share action, because I'm really interested in how investors are starting to get interested in the business that they invest into. Now, clearly there's always been ethical businesses like yours, 
but now we're starting to see mainstream investors get involved. Can you just tell us a little bit about what your perception of that, the, the uh, investor voice is in the boardroom, how important it is, and what it might look like in the future? Yeah, absolutely. And if I may, I might take your question back a few steps and build up to that, because one of the things I've learned on my journey um, is the etymology of the word company, where it comes from, right? And it comes from come and panis, two words that, that mean with bread. It's about people sitting down and breaking bread together. It's about people. It's not about the economics. The economics and the profit drives and, um, the, the delivery of the, the mission and the, what people aspire to. You and I buy any product, everybody listening buys any product only because we think it's gonna improve our lives. It, it, so, so business improves life. So business is about people. So if you put it in that context, we should have created a system that allows decisions within that system to benefit people all the time. And of course it doesn't. We've set up this economic system that is um, shareholder first and, uh, and everybody else second so that shareholders can destroy an environment, make money for their shareholders in the short term and leave the rest of us without the beautiful environment that we need. That, that's clearly wrong, but that's what the system it, it drives to happen. It also drives things to happen in the short term as well. We want, we want results today. The, the public companies need their quarter results. Private equity needs their three, four, five year results. Even politics needs a four year return. So everything in society is designed to short term. Yet you, I, everybody watching needs the long term. We believe in the long term. We're driving, we're, we're rearing children for the long term. We want the security of our defenses and our environments and our pensions, all of those for the long term. So our system doesn't deliver that. The second thing is the regulation around our system is failing us too, in terms of, you know, marketing really works. I've set up a fantastic brand, really, really proud of it. I know that, that, that brands validate people's sense of being and, and community and who they stand for. That, that's what, but it's, it's almost a passive thing for a brand. It's not saying, this is what we stand for, you should come to us. It's saying to, to people, we know what you stand for, this is how we're helping you live your life. So it's, it, it, it's, it's a push rather than a pull sort of thing. Yet, yet it, it is easily manipulated, let's put it that way, in, in terms of pushing things to people that they don't want, that doesn't improve their lives, that they're told that will improve their lives. And um, we're in a society where everything is marketed at us. There's advertising opportunities everywhere. And that's not, that's not good for the responsible consumption and a responsible, sustainable planet. And then the, the, the final thing I think is around tech and around how we've created a social, especially for younger people, we've created a social um, society, social system where the pressure is on to buy to look good, to have consumption, to have material things, and, and to be part of a group, a, 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 a generation, a set of generations that, that, that take value from having stuff and sharing the fact that they've got stuff. So all of that sort of works against responsible consumption. And that's what the, the financial system is operating in. So if it take right back to, it's really about people. And, you know, anyone watching this will have, their, we all have different sets of values. But we'll all, we'll all want to consume based on those values. That'll be part of the decision. Obviously, price and quality and availability and everything, but part of that. So if we've got two things that are pretty much exactly the same, sitting next to each other on a shelf, let's call them the smoothies, and one of them's got a little bobble hat on, and we trust and we know that 5p from that purchase is going to go to help lonely old, older people, you know, most of us would say, okay, we'll go, we'll go for that one. It will be part of our, our decision-making process. So from little things that we buy day to day, that's part of our decision process. But when you come to the financial system and pensions and the stock market and portfolios and things like that, most of us like, I, I, don't, I don't understand it. I'm not connected to it and I'll leave it to others. And it becomes anonymized and depersonalized and the connection between people gets lost. And the system, the pressure is of the fund manager, who's a person who is thinking the rest the same as us, but the pressure of the system is for that person to make those, those, those economic system things that I said were wrong decisions. So purchase shares in a portfolio for the short term because they've spotted something that isn't real value, isn't really adding, um, uh, va uh, improving the world or improving people's lives. And, and so the system gets skewed. So my point is the system has created, uh, we've created a financial system 
whereby because so many of us fear it or don't feel connected with it or just want to, to, to work elsewhere and don't feel we can influence it, then um, it, it becomes anonymized, it becomes um, uh, you know, engineered and it becomes not human and it comes purely, purely to get short-term returns. And that can be at the expense of the environment, communities, individuals, health, everything. So we've set up a system that again creates the wrong behaviors. And um, so, but, but it is, I think the people that a individual company, and it has to be a public company, I guess, but, but, but really any company, listen to most, I think, are their investors. Everyone likes to say it's the consumer. I, ha I happen to say actually it's your employees, but, but investors are hugely influential about how a company, um, what, what strategy it has or what it, what it does. So um, getting more humanity into the investment decisions, forming a, a better thread of connection between the person on the bus and the pension manager who's managing that person's pension, um, it, all will help make better decisions. And I think regulation can help that. I think uh, um, culture and, and consumer power can help that. And I also think deep thinking within the um, financial sector about what the point of the sector is and how they can make the most return over the long term and bring the best uh, world the, through their influence um, are, are three ways that, that we can change that. But you, you and I know that over the last few years, ESG, environmental, social and, and governance concerns around investment decisions have really gone up um, the agenda in terms of influencing decision making. Um, not only for, for the pension managers and the fund managers, but also slowly right down to the rest of us. So um, I think the system is set up wrong to, 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 to maximize the right decisions for people, but I see opportunities all the way through that we can change that. And I'm encouraged that there is momentum moving. We know that in this last awful, awful year, that the, 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 the public companies that have done best, the sectors that have done best have been those that um, are uh, most ESG aligned um, and um, investing and creating products and services for the long term that benefit us all as a society. Yeah, and Paul, a brilliant exposition on the, the many failings of, of, of today's system and you know some of the pathways forward. I mean, I love what Share Action's done to start to lift the transparency lid on this opaque world, benchmarking the world's biggest asset managers, grading them A to E, over 50% of them graded D to E. Now, as much as those men and women are making an awful lot of money from, um, from the system, none of them want to be back at the bottom of that league table. It drives them to improve the performance up the hill. So I think transparency matters enormously as well, on top of the, the very, very good points you've made. That's, and you, you know, I didn't answer your question. You said specifically about share action, and you for a good answer, answer my question, which is fantastic. But share action are a great um, player in this trying to change this system by trying to democratize, to show that business can be democratized in terms of the investment side of it. So all of us that have a few little shares, either in our pensions or individually in these big public company and think we've got no voice, we can have a voice. We can, we can pool our power. We can get resolutions tabled at, at AGMs and we can hold the, the managers of these big businesses to account to do the best for society as well as their shareholders, stakeholder economy. And, and that's what Share Action does and really effectively too. And Paul, I'm really glad you've, you've, you've raised this because we, we sense as individuals that our purchasing decisions on a day-to-day -day level can make a difference. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. But I want people to recognise that their decisions as investors make a difference as well. We might feel powerless in this system that turns up trillions of dollars a year on the global scale. But the decisions we make about where we invest our money, where we bank, make a big difference too. Now, there's something you mentioned about the corporate life, breaking the bread. And that struck me, that reminded me about your relationship with Toast Ale as well. So let's just take it now from the big picture into a specific um, business model. And maybe we just unpick some of these themes around the Toast Ale business model and some of the things they've done. And I'd love you then at the end of that, just to give some advice to any aspiring purpose-led entrepreneur who's watching this. Yeah. What are the three to five things that will help you get from an idea on a piece of paper onto the shelves of Tesco's. But let's start with the, the Toast Ale story first. Okay, so Toast Ale shouldn't exist. If we hadn't set up an economic system that um, fails us, wouldn't need to exist. But we have created that system. And we've created a system where 
Um, we produce a third too much food every single day. With bread specifically, 44% of the bread baked today will never be eaten. Now that to me is just in a, a single example, uh, just shows how crazy that fact that everybody in the system all the way down the supply chain is economically incentivized to produce too much bread, right from the farmer through to the supermarket, um, all the way through. Um, and at least as a society, as a problem, what do we do with the 44% of the bread that we've spent money, we've spent resources, we've affected the environment, uh, creating that now we've got to throw away or reuse or work out what the hell we do with it and how we move it from A to B and get, uh, and, and get it off the supermarket shelves, I guess. And um, that's where Toast Ale came in. Uh, because uh, we thought back, uh, and uh, with, with many others as well, there's, there's a movement to this going on, uh, and knew that like when, when human beings first started farming and wheat started to be farmed, people made bread and people made beer at the same time with the wheat that they'd grown. And so the, the, the uh, history and the, the development of both those products have, have, have been in tandem. Um, and um, so we sort of worked, we'd, we'd seen it in Belgium, we worked with uh, some, some brewers in Belgium and we worked out um, to, uh, a way to source surplus fresh bread from the marketplace. Um, so we work with sandwich providers, some of the supermarkets uh, who, who need to get rid of the bread uh, and they give it to us effectively. Um, and we put that into our recipe and we create delicious craft beer um, from that. And uh, so we've, up, we've upgraded the, the, the problem with the, the product from bread now to beer with added value um, and uh, put it back into the supermarkets and to bars and pubs and, and, and into the um, on trade and off trade and, um, and sell, sell it. Now we sell it and it works and people buy it not because of what I've just said, but because it's delicious craft beer. That is why any of us want a beer. We don't want it because it's going to save the world. That's kind of secondary. We want it because we want a beer. We want to enjoy that beer. We want to buy another beer. And the, the brand wants them to buy another beer and to tell their friends about the beer. Um, obviously, um, food shouldn't be wasted and neither should you. So we should all drink responsibly. Um, but um, so so what we what we do, this is this kind of and it took a little bit of time to work out this hierarchy of you get the beer because you want a beer. Then we've got this great opportunity to speak about the story of why this beer exists. So on the packaging, on the labeling, that's the, the best place, the most obvious place, um, the most influential place to speak about it. So we speak about uh, uh, food waste and the statistics and little stories around, uh, around that. And then um, obviously inside the product is food waste and the packaging is all sustainable and, and we work towards that. And then, um, then we use that to start conversations and to start campaigns uh, around highlighting what's in the bottle and on the bottle. So for example, last week, we know it's uh, a year away from COP26 and we've started a year long campaign which is around raising awareness of food waste and um, how food waste needs to be incorporated into the, um, uh, the, the goals of 2015, 2030. Um, and um, uh, by developing seven new beers across this next year, uh, six weeks apart each time, each one working in collaboration with uh, another company, Toast Ale's B Corporation, we work with seven other B Corporations to create unique beers uh, between two sets of surplus products um, and, and to, to deliver seven delicious beers to people over this next year, each one raising a different issue around the climate. So the one we just launched a year out was a delicious chocolate stout with um, surplus chocolate um, from uh, Divine uh, and uh, our, our surplus bread, and, and that's out there now. So, so we, we try to use our influence to, to create change. And then we um, have decided that we will not re release any dividends to any shareholders, all the money will stay in to create more impact with the products that we create or to, um, to donate to um, food waste charities and food waste projects and research that will help uh, make a more sustainable future. So I love everything about it. I, I, the main thing I love most is the people, their passion, their ideas, their ability to pivot in this awful year, especially in the hospitality industry. And we've managed to uh, 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 find our way through that. But then the, 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 the way that it's a beautiful brand, there's a fantastic product, but the whole thing is, is set in a circular economy um, so that it minimizes its impact, it maximizes its opportunity, it delivers things that improve people's lives, but it improves the life of this planet 
um, through a consistency of every, every touch point it has with the planet of a, a, a constancy of what we're trying to do and it all works together beautifully. Outstanding. And, and again, to, to, to take the big picture and bring it down to the, the sort of specific example, because they're very fantastic. Yeah. Now, 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 but you, you know, asked me, sorry, Mike, you asked me. The young entrepreneur. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so I would say to anyone thinking about starting up a business that has, uh, uh, that, that feels as though they want a purpose for the business beyond, um, beyond making profits. Now, and, and profit isn't a dirty word in all of this. It, it, it's, it's vital. Businesses have to make money to be able to sustain, to make their impact that they, they want later. Profit is a motive for all of us, so, but it, it just needs to be put in, uh, it, it, in balance with, with all the other responsibilities that businesses have through a social contract with society that they have. So the, the advices that I would give was first, give yourself confidence that the equation that has profit and purpose in it have those two things on the same side of the equation. You're not balancing reducing your profits because you're raising your purpose. The two things work hand in hand, as you can see with Toast, as uh, an uh, example there. You will make more profits if you believe in a higher purpose than making those profits. Um, and because the truth and the trust and the authenticity of what you're trying to do, if you've got a sustainable business for, for the long term, an economically sustainable business, um, that will be, do better. So one is really about the confidence. Number two is um, the, the people point. Business, businesses don't succeed because they have great business plans. Businesses succeed because they have great business plans implemented by great people. And any, you speak to any investor, small investor, all those big pension fund people, um, they look at the management team. They look at the capacity of the people and their motivations within that business. So that's number two. When you're looking at people um, and uh, teamwork, teamwork absolutely key. No entrepreneur changed the world on their own. They changed the world because they inspired a team. The team had new ideas. The team developed the entrepreneur's idea and together they changed, they, they, they changed um, their sector or their, their, their little world. Um, the third then thing in, within people is understand people's motivations for working for you, for investing in you, for buying from you um, as, as a consumer. And really, you know, think of business in, in psychology. What is it that just nudges an investor to invest at all or another, another round uh, or a consumer to tell their friend that, that you've doubled your, your consumer base or tell five friends and you fivefold increase, include, increase your consumer base. What, what is it about us that, and, and, and to me, it comes down to um, alignment of values you, you feel in the right place. You obviously need the product. That, that's why you're buying from it. You should market responsibly around that. Um, uh, 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 but the second thing is about trust. You've got to trust that what they're day, doing is, is what they say they're doing. And that's where in any brand of business, well, probably any business, but I know consumer brands, you know, the 1%, the half percent of the thing that doesn't, that you're communicating to somebody somewhere that jars with the other 99.9% .9 of the stuff that you say, that's not a 0.1% of, a, of, a, of a, an impact. That's 50% of the impact and it really jars. That's why, so, you, you know, your, 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 your story is really important um, as, a, as a setup entrepreneur, but that has got to be authentic and consistent and constant and you know, you've got to start that story and those values and living everything that you say from inside of your company. So you, the way you set up your culture um, uh, and your rewards and your motivations and who you recruit and all of that stuff is, is without that, you're never going to convince people authentically that, that to the outside or whatever you're marketing or whatever you're saying to the outside works unless you're living it on the inside. And the final thing that I think I would say is let's, let's Go, in, go into this not thinking about I need to compete with everybody and I win and you lose and there's, there's a, there's a win-lose sort of thing. Everyone is inter interdependent in this um, ecosystem that, that you're entering and you will get, you will be able to collaborate with your suppliers and your customers and your competitors to raise everybody's um, uh, standards and, and opportunities uh, 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 and, and the market. Um, so obviously you, the, there are regulations, quite right regulations with your competitors about what you can talk about to do with, to do with price and, and, and competition. But you know, you are, if you're in, if you've got similar packaging, maybe you're developing solutions to make that more recyclable or make that more reusable and you should work together to do that. 
the big supermarkets, your old world. Um, you know, the supermarkets have so much information about us as consumers that overlapping each other, they, they've got this huge profile of like how we shop, what we do, how we live. And their opportunities to collaborate with that, to bring solutions, to bring insight before the solutions about how we live. But then with the influence of their budgets and their marketing opportunities and the credibility that we all give to them, the, the opportunities to change us. And that's happened with plastic bags, for example, um, and, and the use of, of, of some ingredients in food products and things like that. They do, they do work on that level. So really, I, I would say go in and learn from your competitors, learn, talk to everybody, talk and listen, more, perhaps more importantly, and um, work through your life as though you're knowing that you're part of a system that feeds off each other and has an interdependence rather than have just come in to, to plow your own furrow independent of everybody else. Uh, uh, Paul, again, a, a penultimate question in a moment, and, and then at the end, the very end of this, I'm gonna ask you for sort of four or five businesses that you're, gonna, you're thinking getting this very right. Who excites you in the marketplace right now? But before that, let's, let's pick up on this theme of interdependence, because this is at the very heart of the COGO model. It's bringing people together to find brands together that are making a real difference. And if I'm giving you my hard-earned pound, whether it's to buy some food, hospitality, any energy, any other service, COGO is helping you find the better choice out there. Now, I know you've been working in London on child um, well-being and nutrition, bringing together partnerships to work together with civil society, with business. Can you just expand upon this theme of interdependence when it comes to child nutrition? Well, very broadly, interdependence is around recognizing that uh, healthy people, healthy planets and healthy economies are all intertwined. And you can't, you can't have one without the other. You need all three of them need to, 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 to come together. And I think children are probably the, the, the best place um, uh, to, to use as an example. You know, they, they, they are the future of this country, of the world. Whether we succeed in, um, in beating all the challenges that we've got depends on how prepared and uh, our children are for those challenges and how uh, adaptable we, we help them become to a changed world that's going to be there in 10, 15, 20, 50 years time. So investment in children is absolutely key. Now, child obesity, which is the thing that I work most closely with the mayor on in, in London, you know, is often seen as um, a personal failing. It is people that, you know, eat too much pizza, sit on the couch and don't get out. That's, that's kind of Joe's public's idea of why there is this problem. All the experts, you know, my three years of working deeply on this and my work in the food industry before that, and all the academics and policymakers and that, no, that's not true. It is that we've created an obesogenic environment of which all of us as individuals trying to live our lives the best that we can get caught up in that environment. So for example, I know that in London, there's about nine and a half thousand fast food restaurants, which is 40% more fast food restaurants in London than there was one generation ago. Now, <laughs> The evidence is self-evident that with the growth of that, there's been a 40% increase in child obesity in London. Add on to that the amount of advertising that is around, every little bit, whether it's on your phone, whether it's the big billboards and everything in between. Add on to that that the air quality has declined because people drive too much, not, not walk to work. And because the air quality is bad, people, our parents don't want their kids out playing in the streets, playing in the park. Add on to that X, 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 X. There's a whole number of reasons, many to do with poverty, most to do with poverty actually, and the fact that, 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 that people live in unsecured tenancies, have to have three jobs to make the ends meet and, and, um, and have other priorities in their lives that, that all get mixed up. Um, it, it's an environmental problem. So, so if you take that, that analogy of, um, there is a problem, it is solvable, it is solvable by nudges and by big government regulation and small consumer changes day to day, uh, we, we can change this. Um, but um, if you take that as a, 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 and, uh, and, over, uh, and, and look at that in the context, uh, look at the economy in the context of that, the little decisions that we make within the system can make a difference, but it's the system that we have to change. We have to change that system whereby it is more interdependent, where, where 
healthy people planets and, and economies can thrive together where everybody can have access to free and fair markets not not just those in the know or those in the right place or with the right surname or whatever uh getting on the ladder and the, the relationship between government civil society and business is better worked out you know society gives to business um a whole load of benefits business people you know that's another thing for entrepreneurs to think about perhaps um you know, at, when, when you sign your, when you sign your uh, papers that set up your company, the rest of us are giving you limited liability. So you really mess up and your liability is limited. We give you certain leeways on what you can report and not report. And you've got to take them with responsibility, I feel. That's part of the give. You've got to make your business, make success. Everyone wants to make success. Train people as you go along. Do the right thing to do with what, how you market your product. Pay your taxes, those sort of things. And the rest of society will help you innovate and deliver and buy from and make available your product. So, um, uh, like with the obesity, we need to really look at how we can change the economic system from the top, how we can use the consumer power, employee motivation, uh, and good citizenry to, to, to nudge and change the culture around what we buy and how we consume. And then, as you mentioned earlier, um, a similar angle with the investors and, um, uh, uh, and make sure there's a responsible investment. But, you know, the whole system, I'll just finish with this and sort of say, the whole system is set up. Somehow we've created this and, and you know, human beings kind of don't know when a good thing turns into a bad thing, I guess, is the, is the problem. Uh, why we need regulation, we need sort of, we need to stop and think sometimes. But, you know, the whole system really now is the, the, the de facto position for the businesses and the economy is that people are basically unhappy and by selling them stuff will make them happy so consume 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 and you'll be happier that's what so much marketing is around that's what so much product development's around uh, and that's how the whole ecosystem works yet you know people before the industrial revolution and before the okay, were happy they were poorer they were unhappy about many many things but basic human nature the way we've evolved means that the happier people <laughs> have survived. Human race is fundamentally content and happy and optimistic. We need to get that balance between, do we need to consume? Can we reduce consumption? Can we reject consumption? Can we repurpose consumption, recycle and repair? All of those things that responsible businesses think about to make sure that what we're truly producing from a company's point of view is improving lives. And what we're consuming from a consumer's point of view makes our lives better mm. and, 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 and you know not at the expense of others lives there's a couple of um I, there's a couple of quotes that i heard the other day um what one was around if the product's free you're the product yeah you know and i sort of add on to that if the product's really cheap somebody else is paying and you know, you, you know, a good economic system, you would be aware of who's paying, that the child's going up the tree to pick the cocoa pod that's in your chocolate sort of thing. And the more that transparency comes through, the more we'll be able to nudge consumer behavior to do the right thing for everybody. And that word transparency, again, it cuts through everything we've been talking about, this need for people to say, this is what I stand for, this is what I do. Then the marketplace has got a choice it can make depending on everybody's behavior. But Every system we've got, whether it's the food system or the financial system, it's opaque and people are not able to make a rounded set of judgments on what they do. Well, that's been brilliant. I think what I want to do now is just bring things to a conclude. You've talked very passionately about toast ale to bring to life all these big theories that we've been talking about. Just give me four or five other examples of business that you see who are getting it right and let's hope are the future of responsible capitalism. Yeah. OK, let's um, let me pick a Big, big one and a small, small one and then a couple in between. So big, big one, I think literally this week, the biggest uh, for market capitalization car company in the world, Tesla, produces way less cars than um, the General Motors, uh, et cetera, but highest capitalization. Why has got highest capitalization? Because the markets think that, they, that Tesla has got the future or is leading in the way the future is going. Now, Tesla, um, can be helped massively in getting that by government saying by 2030 we're going to be carbon neutral, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you're not allowed to buy a petrol-based car or all of that. So that's that's government really influencing a, a private company. That private company can push and push and push for innovation within itself, of which I think Tesla does. 
So, you know, I, one of the things I've learned in my 13 years of business is there's, there isn't really black and white, there's loads of shades of gray. And you can think Tesla, great, it's an electric car company, it's a renewable um, energy, it uses renewable energy. Well, it uses the energy that you put into it. So if it's coal-based, then it's a coal-based car. And it has problems around batteries and things like that, that, that. So nothing is black and white, but in my view, they're going on the right journey in the right way, uh, constantly innovating, but bringing joy, not just the mechanics of a better car. So I have a Tesla and the best thing about it, the best thing something my kids when they were younger thought about it was that it's got a button that does a fart noise on it, right? And I thought, okay, that's great. We had a laugh in the car and, you know, put my mother-in-law on and put it on and all the kids laugh. And that's just, that's just fantastic. But I began to think of the way that company is set up so that somebody in a meeting at some point says, got it guys, fart noise. And that got from that meeting through all the gates of product innovation in a really serious product that is a really around the world and safety of your family in the car and all of that, to, to be allowed to be in the final product. And you know, that's one tiny thing. So I assume that the company's culture is all ideas are great ideas, let's make joy in the world as well as functionality. And I just love all, all of that because it really sticks two fingers up at the establishment and says, there is a different way of doing it. And it has its problems, there's the business is all business too. So I hope they focus on solving their, the, the problems that they create, but they are solving a whole load of other problems the rest of us create. That's, that's a big company I really love. Smallest company I know really, still pre-trading, I have invested in it. It won a uh, competition, that an annual competition that I've set up um, every year that I know you're involved with, Mike, called Just Imagine If. Um, and it's for entrepreneurs who have an idea, it's not yet a reality, that addresses one of the sustainable development goals with a business plan and they need help and the, the, to get it to a reality and the prize is £100,000 worth of university support, whether that's business school or um, uh, getting a minimum viable product together or research or whatever. Um, and and the, the original winner of that a couple of years ago um, is uh, a young Peruvian guy whose business is... Um, the output of the business is uh, quinoa-based milk or ancient grains-based milk. Actually, it's got more protein in than, 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 than just quinoa and, and other plant-based milks. But, um, what it's, uh, but, but that's not the reason he set up the, 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 the business. The reason he set it up is he believes that what the natural balance in our world is, is a biodiverse um, environment and that monoculture is ruining that. And therefore he went for quinoa because quinoa grows in a biodiverse hillsides of the Andes and it is picked predominantly by smallholder farmers, or there are many smallholder farmers who are getting a bad buck at the moment, but his company is, is A, pay, paying fair trade and fair, fair price, but also pushing um, the Peruvian government to, to, to change regulation there. But so by, by doing the right thing for the environment and for the people who are the primary pickers of the quinoa and the tawi, um, that producing an added value product um, that is healthy for the rest of us, that is healthy for the planet and healthy for our individual health. And um, he's worked out how that can work through with a delicious product again at the end. So I just think it's great. It's like a bit like toast, great brand, great product, doing good for the environment, doing good for people uh, and um, uh, on trend. So I think it will make money. Okay, so in between that, I've been thinking of a whole load of changes, little nudges to changes in my consumer behavior over the last couple of years that I think are probably one of uh, some good examples. So toilet roll. Who gives a crap? We buy now. Every toilet roll that you buy, a toilet roll is uh, created uh, for somewhere where the sanitary conditions are poor. I can feel good about that. I can uh, feel uh, be made convenient because it's delivered to the house in bulk. So um, saving deliveries uh, and saving the convenience of me. And it's quality and, uh, uh, and all the rest of it. So great, it solves me, my time, and it's doing good. Um, then you've got similar things like Allbirds, fantastic shoes that I've changed to, bamboos, fantastic clothing rhyme that, uh, that I've made, gone to. Uh, let me pick a last one, Mindful Chef, uh, what, which is a small company, but has been bought by a big company, Nestle, um, in the last month. Uh, now, um, Mindful Chef is a B Corporation, uh, it's got purpose behind it, it's set up with, with entrepreneurs who have got passion and a purpose behind them and it's done the right thing in providing uh, uh, meal uh, plans and meal ingredients uh, uh, to my home um, on a weekly subscription basis. Great. Um, 
But the interesting thing is why Nestle bought it to me in terms of good business. And I'd say, you know, Nestle, everyone could knock Nestle for all sorts of things, but in buying purpose-led small businesses, they have the ability to change what the business landscape is because they are perhaps following what they see the consumer demanding, healthier foods, more responsible business, um, more authentic brands, that sort of thing. Um, they've said, I have to believe what I see in public documents and what I see from interviews from both sides is that they will do nothing to change the mission of the company. They will do nothing to engineer costs out of the product. They will just open up new markets, open up their expertise and everything. So by aligning with a big business, they are allowing Mindful Chef to thrive in what it does well, the entrepreneurial feel of we can do this, we can do that, people can't tell us what to do, or we can try and we can fail and we can iterate, and all of the great things that creativity brings with a small entrepreneurial business. And I guess I'm attracted to that because in a way that's what I did with Ellis Kitchen. I sold to a public company uh, and I'm really, really proud that perhaps the proudest thing I am with Ellis Kitchen what happened after I'd sold, and that was that we'd be able to put influence from no shareholder position, but just through talking and through people and through showing them it was the right thing to do to help Alice Kitchen a credit to be one of the UK's first B corporations uh, in 2016. And that by doing that, it means that the, the, the mission of the business is in the constitution, in the articles of the company. It cannot be changed. It validates it. It protects it. It sets the gold standard uh, and it invites Alice Kitchen into this community of four or 500 B corporations in the UK now who are setting out to change what success means in business and to define what business is a force for good can be and show what it does. Paul, thank you. And again, what I love about our conversation is you've taken us from the biggest, biggest, highest level of all the faults of the system we have today. You've taken us down through purpose, how it can be a solution, really practical advice for any entrepreneur wanting to start a business. And you've given us again, the practical examples of people who are doing it big and small are starting to change business for the better. And I would say to anybody watching this, be prepared for change. Whatever organisation you sit in today or might sit in the future, if you're not putting purpose at the very heart of what you do, properly, transparently, with real impact, not just for your, not just for your business, not just for your customers, but for society and planet as well, you ain't going to be around. So prepare for radical change. Paul, you've brought that to a life for us. You've been brilliant. Thank you very much. So that's the end. I mean, Co thank you, Kogo team that brought to us. Please, please, Download the Kogo app. It helps you, the citizen, make choices in your life, support businesses with purpose, big and small, that are making a positive difference to the world we live in. Thank you very much. Have a great day.